Right then guys, here I am for the 24th episode in my Stewards Manager series on Grand Prix World. In this episode, I'm finally going to talk through the FIA rankings and how they work, or at least how I think they work. I still don't really understand it myself, but I can guide you through what I've observed. Let me talk you through my workings as I started off looking at the 1998 season and seeing if the FIA rankings were determined by the Constructors' Championship, but with some artificial and secret points deduction every time a driver retired. On the surface, that theory seems to hold water, as Williams, the team that finished top of the FIA rankings that season, retired fewer times than any other team. Benetton retired seven times in total, one more than Williams, and one less than Ferrari and McLaren. That falls in line with the order of the FIA rankings, and let's not forget, Williams nor Benetton won the Constructors' Championship that year, as it was a battle between McLaren and Ferrari that McLaren won. It's after the top five teams that the theory falls apart, as Jordan retired 11 times, but then it was us with only eight, and we still finished behind them. Then Arrows and Sauber retired on only seven occasions, and they both beat us in the Constructors' Championship, yet they still finished behind us in the rankings. Even if you factor in disqualifications and times where teams fail to have one of their drivers qualify for the race, it still doesn't work. Although I did discover that Jordan were the only team in the whole of 1998 not to have a single DNQ or DSQ, as even Ferrari and McLaren had a total of two. Max Mosley's favourite team still did once, and Minardi had a total of six disqualifications slash times where their drivers failed to qualify. I want to stress just how awful Minardi's 1998 season was. There were 16 races, and they had two race drivers, so they could have had a maximum of 32 finishes. Instead, due to all of the retirements and times where they failed to qualify, their drivers didn't make the finish of a Grand Prix a grand total of 17 times. Luckily, I had the sense to record what the 1999 FIA rankings looked like after only one race, which makes it easier to assess what happened. There were only three retirements in that Australian Grand Prix, one Benetton, Sauber and Tyrrell. Even still, those teams did okay in the FIA rankings, and were placed only slightly lower than they would deserve to be if it was going on pure pace. Then I calculated the average finishing position for the teams, and suddenly, it all makes sense. The FIA rankings almost perfectly fit the average finishing positions of the teams, and I know three drivers didn't finish, but Mika Salo was still listed as 20th. 20 plus 13 equals 33, divided by 2 equals 16.5. Williams are the only out of place team, but if you assume the FIA rounds up the average positions to the nearest whole number, then there's little to dispute. I say little because there do seem to be some hidden prejudices, some of which I think I understand, and some which just seem to be anti-backmarkers. The ones I think I understand are what it seems like the FIA do in a tiebreaker situation. In that 1999 Australian Grand Prix, both Ferrari and McLaren had an average finishing position of 4th. Now you'd think that McLaren would have been placed above Ferrari on the virtue that a McLaren driver, namely Damon Hill, won the Grand Prix with Schumacher in 2nd. Instead the two teams were placed the other way around, and I think what the FIA does to break deadlocks is give preferential treatment to the team with the worst historical results. Think about it. McLaren beat Ferrari in the Constructors' Championship in 1998, and yet, after one race in 1999, the two teams were technically equal. Ok sure, they got the same average finishing positions, but Ferrari scored 7 points in total, and McLaren 10, although the points scored seemed to be less important than the average finishing positions. McLaren beat Ferrari the previous season, yet Ferrari, albeit with only one race in 1999 to go on, closed the gap to McLaren. Either that, or they split the teams by seeing that Ferrari had two point scoring drivers and McLaren only one. 
but surely you'd ensure the system values the number of points scored more so than the number of points finishers. On the anti-small team front, here are the FIA rankings after the first round in the 2000 season. Minardi was second to last in the rankings, and given that both of their drivers retired, that seems fair. Benetton, McLaren, Minardi and Prost all had both of their drivers fail to see the chequered flag. Prost were rightly at the bottom with an average of 21.5, and Benetton and McLaren were slightly further up with an average finishing position of 16th. Minardi had an average of 12.5, yet were placed behind Benetton and McLaren. Minardi's drivers were the last two to retire, yet the team got shoved almost at the very bottom. Ok sure, all four teams had neither of their drivers finish, or score any points, but how come every team finishes exactly where you expect them to except Minardi? This season isn't any different so far as Minardi currently sit second to last in the standings even despite the fact their average finishing positions are better than Pross and tied with Arrows. Sure one of their drivers retired but conversely the other one finished in 9th hence they're not too awful average. Suddenly knowing all of this, if you go back to the post 1999 Australian Grand Prix FIA rankings, they do seem to be weighted against Minardi and even debatably against Tyrrell. And with the FIA's system for their rankings now finally and mostly cleared up, or certainly as cleared up as it's ever going to get, it's on to the second round of the 2001 season with the Brazilian Grand Prix. It's yet another good qualifying performance from Michael Schumacher, he's on pole position. Heinz Aldfrensen in the Benetton is in second, and the other Ferrari of Fizzy Keller has qualified in third place. Yet again, Ferrari doing surprisingly well, however, qualifying is one thing, the race is quite another. Having said that, in Australia, Fizzy Keller started in ninth and still won the race. Anyway, David Coulthard in 4th, Moreira 5th, Damon Hill in 6th. We appear to be the quickest team with a 60% rated chassis, Williams qualifying behind us. But, as I said, qualifying's one thing, the race is quite another. In the Australian Grand Prix, Diniz retired, Takaki finished and in the points, but both Williams drivers beat us and scored points. Anyway, Ricardo Rosset for Minardi in 11th, that's impressive. Bearing in mind, Minardi have got a 40% rated chassis, Tyrrell a 60%, but then again, Ferrari supposedly have a 40% rated chassis. Well, they have to. They absolutely have to. Anyway, let's see down the bottom end of the grid. Jordan actually didn't do that well, to be honest. And then you've got Emmanuel Collard. Jan Magnussen in the Arrows in 17th, that's... Pretty impressive because Arrows have got a 20% rated chassis designed by a one-star chief designer. It's the worst chassis on the grid. Even despite that, Jan Magnussen, a driver who I've been bigging up since the very start of this series, he beat Sarazan Verts in the other Arrows, and actually both Arrows drivers beat both Prost drivers. Jan truly qualified in 20th, Ricardo Zonta in the Sauber in 21st, and the other Sauber qualified in 18th. And anyway, Nakano last, 22nd place in the second Prost. That's slightly disappointing, a dry qualifying session and now an overcast race. Because before this race started, I assigned some set of points. I had a full lineup of them, and I assigned some of them into improving the wet weather ability of Deniz's and Takaki's cars. So those points have been completely wasted. However, I did invest some points into improving the surface and heat ratings of our two drivers' cars. And given that it's a 30 degree day in Interlagos, those heat points certainly weren't wasted. Tora Takaki in third place. Moreira won. Celso Moreira has won a Formula One Grand Prix. What on earth has happened? Moreira, this is only 
his 18th Formula 1 race. At the turn of the millennium, he only just joined a Formula 1 team. Now he's won a Grand Prix. He beat David Coulthard, Takaki in third, Esteban Tuero, the former Minardi driver, beat his teammate to fourth place. Wow, Johnny Herbert in fifth, Pedro Diniz in sixth place. That is deeply, deeply impressive. Fizzy Keller, seventh. He qualified in third. He lost positions throughout the race. Mika Salo in 8th, Irvine 9th, Montemini 10th, I think Michael Schumacher has retired again. And Frenson must have done as well, this is quite a shock. Well let's see. Yes, Michael Schumacher retired, and Damon Hill of course, no surprise there. Frenson with an engine issue, now Benetton run the Ford engine, as do Ferrari. That is a shock. Schumacher, Hill and Frenson. The three main championship contenders, all retired. David Coulthard, still in it, but finished in second place. David Coulthard lost to Moreira. Moreira won the Grand Prix by basically 20 seconds. It wasn't a closely fought victory, it was a dominant performance for someone whose ratings are atrocious. Well, certainly they used to be, but now they should certainly get a bump up if they haven't been already because Moreira, seemingly, hugely, hugely underrated by everyone except the Benetton team. I would never have guessed in a million years that Moreira, and I know we've only done two races, but I would never have assumed that Moreira would ever be joint top of the Drivers' Championship. But there he is, tied on points with Fizzy Keller. Coulthard in third place. One of the very few drivers to score points in both Grand Prix so far. Johnny Herbert has, Tuero has, and amazingly, so has Toro Takaki. Five points in total. Both of our drivers have scored points and very early doors into the season. I have to say, I am quite disappointed with Stewart being fifth in the Constructors' Championship. But... Well, 5th place, 6 points, only 3 behind McLaren, 5 behind Williams. That's the team I think we're really going to be competing with, Williams. Benetton are too quick, Ferrari too quick, although Michael Schumacher hasn't finished the race this season. McLaren, well McLaren have got Damon Hill, and Damon Hill is just cursed to retire 50% of the Grand Prix he enters. So, McLaren... Unreliable, or certainly unlucky, or well, Damon Hill is unlucky at least. Ferrari, Michael Schumacher has been incredibly unlucky this season, but I don't see us beating any of them. I think we can beat Williams, but it's going to be tough. We have both got 60% rated chassis, but who knows? Ferrari have supposedly got a 40% rated chassis and they're third in the Constructors' Championship. And you can't even pin that down to Michael Schumacher because... All 10 of those points have been scored by Fizzy Keller. I bet he is. Celso Moreira is delighted to have won his first ever Grand Prix. That's the first item of news, and rightly so. Now let's see what else has been announced, because I am on the lookout for certain announcements. Right, Selba has done a deal with Johnny Herbert. I've done a deal with Alexander Wurz. I'll talk more about that later on, because of course... Takaki and Deniz's contracts are running out at the end of this season. I'll talk more about Alexander Wurz at a later date, but I am... Thank God. Right, only Damon Hill. I wasn't speaking to Johnny Herbert or Damon Hill. Now, Williams have closed the deal with Damon Hill, so actually, he's going back to where he started. Right, so that's interesting, and lucky because I wasn't speaking to Damon Hill. Benetton... Ha oh, no. Benetton has signed a deal with Stefano Domenicali, and just to make it worse, Ferrari has signed Ian Phillips to run their commercial team. Now that's really not good, not at all, because those are the two five-star rated commercial managers, Domenicali with us. Now, I already made an offer to both of those before the start of the Brazilian Grand Prix, but they both turned us down. Domenicali wasn't happy 
with the length of the contract or the amount of sponsorship royalty bonus. Ian Phillips wasn't happy with the length of the contract or the, the fact the team isn't a championship contender. And to be fair, going from Benetton to Stewart is quite a leap. That's the thing though, I had one shot to sign them, they turned us down and that's it. I cannot get a 5 star rated commercial manager, or even a 4 star rated commercial manager because of course Ekrem Sami has downgraded to 3 stars which is probably lucky because I can't get him anyway. So I've got to get one of these two 3 star rated commercial managers, there's not really any difference actually in the salary or sponsorship royalty. Is there anyone else? No. Giancarlo Minardi has been picked as the least favourite manager. Debatable, but okay. And Frank Williams as the manager of the month. Interesting that he got that over me. Although he's not unworthy of it. Anyway, and I didn't show this, I don't think, in the previous episode, but after the Australian Grand Prix, Ken Tyrrell was named as the least effective manager in Formula 1, and, predictably, Jean Todd, the manager of the month. But given that Fisichella won the Australian Grand Prix, that isn't a major shock. Just a quick reminder of our driver's ability stats. Pedro Diniz won 4-star rating, loads of 3-star ratings, but equally, one star in speed and overtaking. Also one star in morale, but that doesn't really count. Tua Takaki, four stars in speed and concentration, but one three star rating, one two star rating, three one star ratings. John Fellows, to be honest, I'm actually surprised because I'm fairly certain when I signed him at the very start of 1998. In fact, signing John Fellows was the very first thing I did when I took control of the team. I'm fairly certain back then he didn't have two stars in speed and overtaking. I think he had two stars in speed because I think if there was any stat I was going to prioritise it was speed. So John Fellows has actually developed, improved by one in overtaking which is pretty impressive considering He's only ever been a test driver, and he's been stuck with us. Anyway, point being, Toru Takaki, the worse driver than Pedro Diniz, which is surprising given that Takaki much quicker in the Brazilian Grand Prix. But also, remember those stats, because here's how they compare to Alex Wirtz. So Alex Wirtz, pretty much straight 3-star skill ratings. Yeah, well, on average, anyway, excluding morale, because 4-star stamina cancels out the 2-star overtaking. So straight 3-star ratings, salary, dirt cheap. $2.3 million, that is it, for a driver whose stats are that good across the board, and also who's been that quick in previous seasons. Yeah, sure, you're talking a $12 million swing in finances. You're going from getting effectively $10 million from Diniz to paying out $2 million, just over $2 million for Wirtz. But, well, let's remember previous seasons, 1998, Alex Wirtz finished third in the Drivers' Championship, 51 points, only 10 behind Michael Schumacher. Also, I do want to point out Heinz Hald Frentzen, tied on points with Jacques Villeneuve, again, very impressive. Frentzen, a driver to keep in mind. Also, Eddie Irvine, 25 points, but he did spend a good portion of that season injured, so you can't really talk about Eddie Irvine's results in previous seasons. 1999, during Arrow's one season of top-end pace, Wirtz spearheading the team, 41 points, Jan Magnussen, 23. Yet again, another deeply impressive season for Alex Wirtz, Heinz Frentzen third in the Drivers' Championship, beating Damon Hill. Then of course last season, well, Wirtz didn't really do all that well, but he didn't have the car to compete. Frensen, second in the Drivers' Championship, best of the rest, way ahead of everyone else. Fizzy Keller and Coulthard joined third and over 20 points behind, 27 points back. Wirtz, I was able to sign fairly easily, but 
Well, the other drivers, they've had some objections. Eddie Irvine, he's objected. As you can see, he wasn't too happy about joining Stewart, the team conditions. He's just not happy about that. The other drivers I spoke to are Heinz Aldfrensen, who, again, unhappy on a few counts, including joining a team such as Stewart, but much like with Ian Phillips, it's pretty difficult to convince someone to leave Benetton and join Stewart. The other driver I spoke to as a backup, as a real backup, just in case Irvine and Frensen joined other teams, which is entirely possible, is... where is he? You have to go all the way down to the bottom, don't you? I think. Yeah, there you go, Olivier Panis. Williams' current test driver, he is wasted in that role because look at Panis' stats. Two star, five star, two star, two star, three star concentration, four star experience. Even his morale is pretty good, although I think that's pretty irrelevant. And also, the only thing he objected to was championship bonus. I can sign him fairly easily, but, well, Eddie Irvine is the driver I would prefer to get, although 9.1 million dollar salary. He's good, he is really good, 4 star, 4 star, 4 star, 3 star, wet weather even, but that's a lot, 9.1 million dollars. That's why the driver I really want to get is Frensen, because he is slightly worse than Eddie Irvine, but much cheaper, although I do have to better that salary slightly, probably 6 million will do it, although it's still a third less than Eddie Irvine, but look at that. A driver with those stats would be massively helpful to the team, but I am going to cut away right now because, well, Frenson wasn't happy with the contract length, and I do need to, because I've got screenshots on my phone, so I do need to check whether he thought it was too long or too short. Actually, I found it now, so Frenson thought the contract was too short. That's fine. I'll sign him for three seasons, no problem there. Salary 6 million, he should be happy with that. But, does he want to join Stewart? I really don't know, although, I think we have proven ourselves to be a quick team, we've scored points in both races. You know, surely, he's gonna want to join us, especially as he just got slapped by Moreira. Although, I know Frenson did retire, but, Surely, he's got to be at least contemplating moving to another team, and Stewart, one of the best to move to, as it stands. Hopefully, he'll accept. Yes! There you go, Heinz Aldfrensen, ready to join us next season. Fantastic. There you go, don't need Eddie Irvine, don't need Panis. We've got Alex Wirtz and Heinz Aldfrensen, two drivers whose salaries are pretty decent, especially for their skill levels. They're both much better than Deniz and Takaki, and crucially, in seasons gone by, both of them have been incredibly impressive. So, I'm very happy with that driver lineup. Yes, I almost forgot. We've got a new engine upgrade heading into this Grand Prix. A custom-made one by us. No other team on the grid, even the other two Mercedes-powered teams, Jordan and Salba, none of them have got this upgrade because we developed it. However, it's not really an upgrade, it's more of a sideways move because I took one point off of reliability and put it onto power. And, well, an 8 out of 10 reliability engine is still the most reliable one on the grid, apart from Sauber's and Jordan's. Well, who knows, because they've got a works deal, that's the thing. It's because we're only on a partner deal, I can only redistribute points. Sauber and Jordan, potentially, if they got the bonus, can improve the engine themselves. They can add on points. They don't have to take off a point in one area to add it on. They can just do testing, improve the engine themselves. They are not bound by Mercedes' own in-house development team. However, we still are to a large extent. I would rather prioritise power over reliability, and anyway, an 8 out of 10 reliability engine, as I said, is more reliable or as reliable as every other engine on the grid. So, I'm going to confirm, oh no, I need to do it for Takaki as well. So we're both going to be running the B engine, it's not a Model 2, it's a B engine because it's a, it's not really an improvement, it's not a development, it's a, I can't think of the word, a sideways move is certainly the apt way to describe it. 
I don't think there's any tyre upgrades, no, still just the Model 1 for both tyres and the hard tyre yet again, much better than the soft tyre, so I have no idea why you would want to run the soft tyre at all, if you're a Goodyear team at least. And anyway, so let's head on into Argentina for the third round of the 2001 Formula 1 season. <laughs> Typical, yes. A light rain qualifying session, and I didn't do any testing, so I don't have any setup points. I couldn't invest them into improving the rain ability of our car, which is... <sighs> Typical. But I couldn't do any testing because our cars were at 97% wear before testing, so I had to fix the cars because, well, you can't really do much testing on 3% wear. And yes, I could have fixed the cars, then done testing, then fixed the cars again, but that's such an inefficient way to do it. Anyway, a light rain qualifying session, and we don't have drivers or a car capable of doing it. So, well, I'm not expecting much, but let's see, who knows, because a wet session usually throws up chaos. I mean, you expect the... I was going to say the usual four drivers at the front, but of course, Mika Hakkinen has retired, so it's only going to be the usual three drivers at the front, Alacy, Hill and Schumacher. But behind them, anything can happen. Frentzen in fourth place, Fizzy Keller fifth, Coulthard sixth, Pedro Diniz in seventh, Takaki 14th place. But Damon Hill, the quickest of the wet weather specialists, Michael Schumacher second, Jean Alacy in third place. Pedro Diniz in 7th, beating Eddie Irvine, and actually beating both Williams drivers, Johnny Herbert in 9th, Esteban Tuero in 11th, although Moreira, Moreira in 13th, and quite a few, well I say quite a few, 3 drivers didn't make the 107% time, so will not be taking part in the race. Interestingly, both Prost drivers made it, and one Arrows driver did, but neither Sauber driver did. So Sarazan will not be taking part in the race, neither will his teammate Ricardo Zonta, and Jan Magnussen will not be taking part in the race, which, well I guess given that it's a wet qualifying session, I shouldn't really have expected Jan Magnussen to do that well, but then again, Alex Wirtz, the much better driver, that's why I've got Alex Wirtz for next year, because even in that Arrows, with a 20% rated chassis, he qualified in 15th. That's largely down to his wet weather stats, which I think is 3 out of 5, whereas Magnussen's, I'm going to assume, is 1 out of 5. Certainly, it's not good. Hence, how he didn't make the 107% time, and Nakano, Shinji Nakano, in a Prost, did. Yet another overcast race. Now that's interesting because the qualifying session was dominated by the wet weather specialists, Schumacher, Hill and Lacey, but with it being a dry race, that opens up the pool of drivers that could realistically win massively. Frentzen, for example, more than capable of winning on a dry track, or David Coulthard, or Johnny Herbert, or even, I suppose, theoretically, Pedro Diniz. Or Takaki, I better mention Takaki because I don't want to seem like I'm favouriting one of my drivers, that would be an awful thing for a team principal to do. Anyway, I mean, even with it being a dry race, Michael Schumacher more than capable of winning. Same can be said for Damon Hill. Third place! Pedro Diniz in a Stewart finished in third. Toro Takaki fourth. It's a Stewart 3-4 in Argentina. Heinzard Frenson won the Grand Prix, Damon Hill second, but Pedro Diniz, representing Stewart, joins them on the podium. Compare that to Williams, Johnny Herbert finished in fifth, Tuero finished in seventh, he didn't even score a point, Moreira in the Benetton beaten to the final points place, but Stewart scored seven points, Williams two. Actually, McLaren only got 6 in total. David Coulthard finished in 8th place. Fizzy Keller 9th. What on earth happened to those two? Well, would you look at that. Michael Schumacher retired from the race. This time due to an electronics issue, but more to the point. Michael Schumacher hasn't finished a single race this season. 
extraordinary, I know. Fizzy Keller has finished every single one. Michael Schumacher hasn't finished any. So Ferrari have had three retirements from three races so far this season, and all of them have been Michael Schumacher retirements. That is almost unbelievable. Heinzhold Frensen currently leads the Drivers' Championship, with his teammate Moreira in second place. Frensen on 16 points, Moreira on 11. He's ahead of Giancarlo Fisichella, who's third in the championship, David Coulthard fourth with 9 points, then it's Herbert and Takaki tied in fifth. Damon Hill seventh in the championship, Deniz joint eighth with Tuero, and only one point behind Damon Hill. Whoa, the Constructors' Championship is looking very tasty indeed. Benetton leading the way by 12 points, so they've got a reasonably sizable gap over McLaren in second. However, McLaren on 15 points, Williams and Stewart are tied on 13 points each. We're joint third in the Constructors' Championship, equal with Williams and three points ahead of Ferrari. So there's only five points separating McLaren, Williams, Stewart and Ferrari. We're ahead of Ferrari, we're tied with Williams, we're only two points behind McLaren. This season is going incredibly well for Stewart. The one constant with this series, because a lot of things have changed. Drivers have gone to different teams, teams have got different engine supplies. Even Ferrari haven't kept hold of their own engines, because technically they're not their own engines, it's weird. But the one constant in all the chaos is that Michael Schumacher has been a Ferrari driver. Well, not anymore. He's going back to Benetton for next season, replacing Moreira. Moreira has agreed to race for Ferrari next season. That is extraordinary. Well, we've learned what Tanaka's first name is. It's Hiroshi. And we finally get to look at the man himself. Anyway, Hiroshi Tanaka has signed a deal with Williams. That is as their test driver. Don't worry, Tanaka isn't going to be racing for Williams. It's only the test driver seat that is available at the team. However, that does mean Tanaka is replacing Olivier Panis. So I don't know what's going to happen to Panis. Potentially, he might even fall out of Formula 1 altogether. I don't know, but I would be surprised if he wasn't picked up by another team. Even if it's just a test driver role, because... I mean, Panis is too good to not be in Formula 1, but certainly too good to be a test driver. I mean, Tanaka is pretty much ideal test driver material because he's cheap. Tom Walkinshaw, the Arrows manager, has been named the least effective manager in Formula 1. And David Richards, the Benetton manager, has been named manager of the month. Here we are yet again at the end of another episode, and I hope you guys did enjoy this episode, if you did, be sure to leave a like, comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. And actually, the next episode is going to be interesting, certainly the start of it, because I've had to look around at some of the menus. The commercial situation, the commercial negotiations we're currently involved in, have taken a very interesting turn, a positive one for us. I'll reveal that in the next episode. Also, I'll show off the FIA rankings because they are incredibly interesting. Partially because they, in essence, confirm what I was talking about earlier on in the video about the FIA rankings being determined by the average finishing positions of the teams. But more than that, how the FIA rankings have played out is incredibly interesting. Anyway, I'll talk about that in the next episode and I'll see you guys then.